Good morning, everyone. Uh, since I was an adolescent, probably, I've always been fascinated by why different parts of the world are organized so differently. And I guess most of my research has been trying to understand why that is and what its consequences are. So there's lots of ways you could think about that. But here's one on this diagram. On the horizontal axis, you could think of the power of society, how society is organized collectively. Is it mobilized? Can it articulate collective demands? On the vertical axis is the power of the state, the ability of the state to control society, regulate it, organize it, tax it. And societies around the world differ in where they are on this diagram, in the balance between the state and society. In some, in some parts of the world, the state dominates society. And in other parts of the world, you could say society dominates the state. So let me, let me start by talking about one of those, which is a situation where the state dominates society. So what's a, what's a good example of that? I'd say China was a good example of it, or perhaps Russia. In China, the state is very powerful, and society is dominated by the state. And what's interesting about that is that's a very old situation. That goes back a long, long time. Two and a half thousand years ago, Confucius, in his Analects, one of his aph aphorisms was, commoners do not debate matters of government. Okay? Confucius had a model of how political society was organized that didn't involve accountability or representation. And it's been like that for a long time in China. And the relationship between the state and society was also laid out shortly after this by Lord Shang, or Shang Yang, who was one of the intellectual masterminds of the first Chinese dynasty, the Qin dynasty. He'd lived about 100 years before the Qin dynasty started. And here's what he had to say about the relationship between the state and society. Okay? When the people are weak, the state is strong. Hence, the state strives to weaken the people. His model of how you organize political society was a state which controlled and micromanaged society. And that's still the model of governance in China today, all these thousands of years later. We could go right the way through to something else that happened just over 30 years ago in Tiananmen Square, which was the crushing of this democracy movement. We could come right the way up to the present. If you've been in Tiananmen Square more recently, you see face recognition cameras appearing everywhere. So as we speak, the Chinese government are putting up 200 million of these cameras throughout China. 200 million, it's a lot of cameras. So when George Orwell wrote his famous book, 1984, he, he had this famous expression, big brother is watching you. So at that time, it wasn't technologically possible for Big Brother to watch you, but, but now it is. So here's a society, here's a situation where the state dominates society, and it has done for a very long time. But obviously, if you start thinking about the world, that's not the only possibility. There's lots of places which don't look like that at all. So here's another example. Think of Yemen or Lebanon. That's not a place where, those are not countries where the state is dominant. It's actually almost the opposite. Society is dominant. Society is very organized. And it's so organized that the state can hardly form or emerge. Okay? In fact, in Yemen, every boy, when they're six, gets their first dagger. And every man has to have a dagger in Yemen. In fact, it's very closely related to what social psychologists call the honor culture. And in fact, you can't have honor unless you can defend your honor. And to defend your honor, you need weapons like a dagger. Now, it's interesting because in social science, when we start thinking about the state, most, most of us would start thinking about the great German sociologist Max Weber, who proposed perhaps the most influential definition of what a state is. And he said, it's, you know, it's the entity that has the legitimate monopoly of violence in society. Okay? But that's a useless way of thinking about Yemen. Actually, in Yemen, it's not the state 
that has a legitimate monopoly of violence. It's society. Every person in society has a legitimate use of violence, not the state. So it's the, it's the, the opposite of what Yemen was talking about. What are the implications of the state dominating society or society dominating the state? Well, if you think about my analogy to Big Brother and you think about what life is like in China, that's a situation where there's very little liberty in the Western sense of the term. There is a state and there's possibility for some types of economic growth, but what you see in China historically is that's prone to be very transitory and subject to major crises and instabilities. In Yemen, it's a very different situation. But if you think about liberty, there's not that much liberty in Yemen either. There's a lot of violence in a society where everybody has a dagger and nowadays a gun. And many restrictions and social norms appear in societies like that in order to substitute for the lack of a state. For example, Yemen has the lowest rate of female labor force participation of any country in the world, according to UN data. And of course, Yemen is a very poor country, so in a society organized like that, it's difficult to sustain economic development. But apart from situations where the state dominates society or society dominates the state, you can think of other countries which seemed more balanced. And in fact, think, here I put on the diagram Western Europe, North America. So according to our argument, What's interesting about Western Europe and North America and what explains their distinctive historical, political or economic trajectories is they managed to attain much more of a balance between state and society than China or Yemen did historically. How do I think about that? Well, it's also very historic. If you go back to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire about one and a half thousand years ago, a political entrepreneur, a German political entrepreneur called Clovis, created the first kingdom of the Franks. So he was a Frank, they were Germanic tribes, they came from beyond the Rhine, and he brought together the very participatory institutions of the Franks, very participatory political institutions, with late Roman state institutions, administrative institutions, fiscal, legal institutions. And Clovis promulgated something called the Salic Law. And here's a little bit of the preface of an existing copy of the Salic Law. He promulgated it, but he didn't write it. Okay? In fact, when you read the preface, you see that there were four lawgivers, Wizogast, Arrogast, Saligast, and Widogast. It sounds like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but what's interesting about these lawgivers is they were elected at legal assemblies. So the Salic law was a very bottom-up codification of social norms and customs of the Germanic tribes. It's a completely different entity from the Qin legal code. If you look at the Qin, the existing bits we have of the first Qin legal code, it's out of the mind of Lord Shang. It's about controlling and regulating society. The Salic law is a completely different beast. And so, the argument here is that historically, at this moment, this balance between state and society came together. And it's been very persistent in uh, Western Europe ever since, the old bits of the Merovingian and Carolingian empires. So just to put this on a diagram and to put some arrows to suggest momentum, what I'm suggesting here is that if you think if you start thinking about this balance between state and society, it seems like you can explain quite a lot of variation in the world in terms of how different societies work and how prosperous they are and how much liberty they generate. And these divergences are very historic. And in the middle, between the dominance of the state over society or the dominance of society over the state, there's what we call a narrow corridor, hence the title of the talk and the book, there's a narrow corridor where this balance can emerge. And that's the part of this space where you get prosperity and you get liberty. Let me say two things. The first thing is 
What's evident from European history is that it's a pretty bumpy ride in the corridor. So this is not a miraculous solution to some constitutional design or engineering problem. It's a constant contest between the state and society, the state trying to control society, society trying to balance and control the state. And historically, on many, in many periods, different countries have been in the corridor and thrown out of the corridor. But the good news is what you see historically is an enormous amount of persistence or path dependence, you'd say, in social science. Meaning, once you get in the corridor, there's a lot of forces that tend to keep you there. And even if you get out of the corridor, you can understand how to get back into it. That's the good news. The bad news is that even short periods out of the corridor can have enormous consequences for human uh, welfare. The other thing which I think is interesting about this diagram here, and going back to uh, some place rather close to here, when the Berlin Wall fell down, this diagram and this way of thinking suggests that the idea that many people had in 1989 that there was going to be convergence of institutions towards some model of Western liberal democracy is a, it's a very ahistoric prediction. If you think about history, convergence isn't the norm. Divergence is the norm. China's been like that for a long time. What about Yemen? Well, we actually know quite a lot about Yemen going back at least a thousand years. And what we do know suggests that's a very stable way of organizing society. The types of practices we see in Western Europe are also very historical in this argument. And so you wouldn't expect convergence. In fact, the way I drew the arrows here, the way I drew the arrows suggests that once the state starts dominating society, that tends to pull you to the boundary. And once society starts dominating the state, that, tells, that tends to pull you in the, towards the other boundary. And that's a very stable situation. So there may, history may end, but in a very different way than perhaps was imagined in 1989. Okay, thank you.